we have reached the end of another week, the end of another lesson, and we are grateful for that. Now, obviously, if you're not watching this right now or today, you're watching this days, months, years later, if Jesus hasn't come, you're welcome. And we invite you to be here today, but make sure you go back and listen to some of the lessons from before. You'll see them pop up along the video. I even can click on some of those links associated with this, depending on where you're watching, because to get the whole message, you know, it's good to get one burrito, but when you can get the whole deal, the whole package where you get two or three and you get some sides, that that really, that's really a good thing. And that's what we want you to do by going on to changeministry.org or hitting us up at Facebook or YouTube. And let's continue to connect with each other so that what we learn, we can live for others. So with all that said, let's get to it. We are in the last part of this week's lesson, looking at the Apostle Paul in Rome, really focusing on the Roman church before we get into the letter itself. And so today we're going to talk about some final points, parting words on this week's lesson. And so Jesus, thank you that you gave yourself so freely to this church to help us to know today that you also want to freely give yourself to us if we would just believe. So in Jesus name, Lord, we pray. Amen. All right. The Apostle Paul's letters we're talking about. Romans 1 verse 8. The verse says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. We talked about this faith yesterday. And please go back and listen to that study. The faith that these folks had, it was the faith of Jesus, the gift that he gives to all men. And they capitalized on it by believing in him. And so we can even do that today. But that was a previous lesson. Make sure you check that out because today we're going to go forward. These are the anchor texts for this lesson. And so let's look at the big three. The big three points that we want to get from the thought today are these. That being that, remember, any text, any information, but specifically a Bible text without context is pretext. In other words, it's very easy to walk away with your own interpretation when you don't compare it in the light of other scriptures or what's happening in that verse. A perfect example of this is in Luke 24. This is when the Lord is speaking. Jesus is walking on the road uh, to Emmaus with those who have just uh, heard and, and seen about all that's happened on his day of crucifixion. And so he's talking to these two brothers and he says to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So now what does he do? He opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he says to them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In other words, he's using 46, verse 46 is the conclusion, but he goes back in verse 44 and he uses the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the Old Testament as we would understand it, to give context to what is now happening in the New Testament to give a background to what just happened that weekend. And now they can see, oh, now we see why the king of the universe would suffer and die because it's been prophesied and it was needed as we see in the scriptures in the Old Testament. Context is what Jesus simply gives them to let them know the mystery of his will. In Ephesians chapter one, verse nine, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. God is not into mysteries and secrets and unknowns. Let me make that very clear because there are many people who are confusing mystery and secrecy with divinity. And because of that, they even can create clubs or groups or societies or organizations that then say, well, because the, we know something so special, everyone can't know it. So therefore, if you know it, you got to first be made special. This is the process of initiation. This is a process that's common to secret societies or fraternal societies, whether they be fraternities, sororities, or even escalated into Freemasonry and even groups that are so secretive that I don't even know them. But the fact of the matter is that that whole idea of mystery and divinity is unbiblical. Because the Bible says that he has made known to us the mystery of his will. And any group that says that it's a mystery 
that is God's will, we know that's the spirit of Antichrist, even the spirit of Satan. Because his desire is that all men would come to repentance. And how can a man, how can all men or all people come to repentance without a knowledge of God and his grace and his perfect will? And so that's why we want to make sure we're clear on this point. And we still steer clear. And even if we must ask God for deliverance from any club or group that would make that a part of what they call, quote, the gospel. So now getting to the verse in Colossians 1. Verse 9, again, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is his prayer to the church of Colossae. This is God's will for us today. To whom God wants to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now, you can't get any less exclusive than that. The Jews that thought that they were exclusive, Paul says, look, God wants to let everybody know about the mystery of his love, even among the Gentiles. And you know what that great mystery, you know, you know what's in the box? You know what this is in the box, the treasure? Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's the big idea. That's the ooh-ah moment. The idea that Christ will live in me so that I can live in him. I can reflect him even in his absence. That's the hope of glory for God's character to be in me and to be in you. This is why I thank the Lord that he is not exclusive. Instead, he lays out the whole matter and gives context to help us to see that if you don't understand background and context, it will really affect what it is you're focusing on. And this is kind of a rough picture of a pizza on a plate and pizza on a manhole cover and while you might like pizza the context will dictate whether or not you want to eat it in the same way scripture has context that is important to take time to consider that will only give greater light to your understanding greater joy to your feast if you will so now let's get to a second point second point for the lesson today is this and that is that paul wrote to the roman church to prevent the galatian situation now we spent a whole quarter talking about what happened in the church in Galatians. But let's hit it just in case you didn't catch that. Because he says on that same missionary journey, I believe it was the third missionary journey, Paul also stopped by Galatia. After he had spent some time there, he departed, went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So now he knows what's going on in Galatia and he wrote a whole letter to them to instruct them to not make this mistake. In the letter, he writes, O oh, foolish Galatians, chapter 3, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, the warning, what Paul was trying to get Galatia to turn back onto the road and get off of, was the idea of works and grace as opposed to grace by faith in Jesus Christ. The hearing of faith is what he wants them to live by and it's the same burden that he has for the church at Rome. He says, for God is my witness. Not that they had that issue. Remember, he just commended them. But he wants to make sure that what happens in Galatia doesn't trickle up or trickle down to Rome. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. And you know what? Making requests, if by any means now, at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to even to come unto you. I really want to come up there and talk to y'all and encourage you and make sure you all stay on point and trust in a God that loves you more than you can love yourself. That was what his desire was. And this is why he had this burden and why this book is such a beautiful gift. Again, context lets us know that this book is, its goal is to keep the eyes of the church focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith, to not make the mistake that as they grew to turn aside from the faith or as they suffered to try to accommodate their message as opposed to just trusting in it or affirming it. These are the things that, that drove the writer and that's why this context is so helpful to see that that's why this book is still good for us today. It helps to keep our eyes focused on Jesus.
So finally, the third point of the lesson is that we see that the book of Romans establishes the principles of the gospel, the core principles of the gospel. These are what we're going to be talking about now for the remainder of our time. But as we look at that verse, those verses rather in verses 15, 16, 17 in chapter one, 15 says, so as much as is in me, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are also at Rome. Also, I'm ready to, to share what God is, it's, I'm not taking away what you have, but I want to I want to really gird and ground what it is that you've learned. So Paul was ready to preach the message. What was he ready to preach? He says, in fact, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God. It is like a firework. That word power is deutimos. That's the same word we get dynamite from. The gospel is like dynamite. It's like a firework of God unto the salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, any and everybody can get blown up. <laughs> your whole old way, your old man, the old woman, that can all get done away with demolition and then make way for a new birth, a new beginning. That's what the gospel does. Paul says, for herein is the righteousness of God revealed. See, it's one thing for God to just be righteous, but the gospel, it takes all that God is. It takes all of that, packages it into that dynamite pack, and it puts it in me. It puts it in us so that God's righteousness now explodes from me. It is revealed in my life from faith to faith. I never lose that faith. Even as I grow, I grow in the grace of God. I don't grow out of the grace of God. I will always need him. And in needing him, I will constantly rely on him by faith to faith to faith. Because it's written, more context, the just shall live by faith. More Old Testament context for New Testament truth. The just shall live by faith. These principles are wrapped up or bound in this book so that the whole book just becomes 16 chapters of explosion after explosion after explosion. I hope you're excited about reading this book. I hope you're so excited. You know what? You don't even have to even wait for the lesson. Just sit down and say, Lord, speak to me. And as you're reading the book on your own and reading it yourself, and when you come to the study and we get together, we can just feed off of each other and build each other up as we're gaining a greater understanding that this is the kind of love that God has. He wants this love to be seen. Nobody lights a firecracker and, and puts it under a bushel. I don't think Jesus said that. I think he said no man lighted the candle and put it under a bushel. But it's the same principle. No one wants to light a firecracker and put it under a bushel. Everyone lights it so everybody can see. That's what God wanted to do in the church of Rome. That's what Paul was able to experience. And this is what the Lord Jesus wants to do in us today. A firework of faith exploding in victory, in lifestyle, in love. That's what we're going to get to by his grace in our lesson. And we have to stop it here. Because next week we're going to talk about the controversy. Now looking at why even Paul was in that situation. Remembering that he's on house arrest because of a challenge that was brought by the brethren in Jerusalem. Again, he's contending faith. They're contending tradition. Let's see how the Lord works through this controversy and how God can even help us overcome it today. So until next time, which I hope is next week or the next time you click on the next video, let's all remember, y'all, that in Jesus Christ, change is good.